I'm Quaylin Nassar. You know, sometimes during the holidays, you feel a little bout of the blues. But if it lasts more than a couple of weeks, it could be a bout of depression. Now, depression isn't something you can just snap out of. It takes professional help. And on tonight's AgeWise Weekly, Eleanor Shano and her guests will tell you about the symptoms of depression and how you can get help. Be sure to stay with us and watch, and you'll have a chance to call in your questions, too. And now, here's Eleanor Shano. Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield are pleased to support AgeWise in the interest of better health for area seniors. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to AgeWise Weekly. I'm Eleanor Shano. AgeWise Weekly, a special program that addresses the lifestyles and the concerns of people over the age of 50. Tonight, we're going to be talking about adult depression. Recent studies indicate that depression is a major health concern in this country and that at any given six-month period, some 9 to 10 million Americans suffer from depression. Now, what exactly is depression? What are the symptoms? What are the cures? Those are some of the questions we're going to be answering in the next half hour with our two guests. To my left is Dr. Ellen Frank, and Dr. Frank is the head of the Depression Clinic at Western Psychiatric Institute, and Dr. Jules Rosen. Dr. Rosen is a geriatric psychiatrist. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. I guess the, the biggest question is to define depression. What is the difference between depression and what most of us have all experienced as just feeling blue? Well, I think actually the term depression is one of the most unfortunate terms in all of medicine. We should have called it Lincoln's disease or something to separate it from the low mood that almost all of us feel for a few minutes or a few hours almost, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. When we talk about depression as mental health professionals, we're talking about a syndrome that includes sad mood, to be sure, or it may, may be absence of feeling. Sometimes people get so severely depressed that they don't even feel sadness anymore. But along with the mood changes, we always see changes in sleep, usually less sleep, but sometimes more changes in appetite, usually again a decrease in the appetite, but sometimes people will eat more than is, is normal for them. Loss of interest or pleasure in usual activities, including sex, and sometimes an inability to perform sexually. Uh, decreased energy, the smallest task seems like climbing Mount Everest. Uh, changes in the ability to concentrate or think or remember. And indeed, sometimes patients with clinical depression, major depression, become so sad, so hopeless, that they begin to think about death as an attractive alternative and even begin to plan to take their own lives. When we see all of these things together, the sad mood and at least four or five of these other symptoms, then persisting for a couple of weeks, then we say we have a clinical depression. Can you determine absolutely that, that this is depression and not perhaps symptoms of an, another disease or illness? Well, I think, as Dr. Rosen will, will explain, often me medical illnesses mimic depression. I think he can describe what some of those might be. Yeah, ab absolutely. There are many conditions that will present as depression. So when an, especially an older person comes in with these symptoms that Ellen described, what is required first is a complete medical evaluation as well as a psychiatric evaluation. Um, in, addition, in addition, many of the medications that people are put on can cause depression. So typically it requires a comprehensive review. Some of the medical problems um, range from, from anything from, uh, from cancer of the pancreas to thyroid disorder to diabetes to, to mild congestive heart failure any of these things can present as depression. Dr. Rosen, if, if one suffers from any of the symptoms that Dr. Frank just uh, itemized for us, what do you do? I mean, do you, do you seek immediate help? Do you go to your family physician or do you go to a psychiatrist? 
Well, I, I think a first reasonable step is to go to the family doctor and go to the internist and get all things checked out. There would be nothing wrong with going to the psychiatrist first, and then the psychiatrist would start that ball rolling. It doesn't matter where you go first. What, what's most important is that the depression is properly diagnosed and effectively treated. What is the connection between depression and suicide? Well, we know that not everyone who becomes depressed thinks of or attempts suicide, but we also know that the vast majority of suicides, especially in younger persons, are in people who are suffering from a major depression. So anytime depression is present, there's always a risk of suicide, and it's always something that needs to be thought about and asked about. We would like to hear from you. If you have any questions about depression, about the blues, about any of the things we're talking about tonight with our two experts, please call us. Our phone number is 622-1555. There are different types of depression, I would imagine. What are the types and what is the most common? Well, I think the, the most common distinction that we make is between what we call unipolar depression, that is people who only have one pole, the low pole. Mm -hmm. They may have multiple episodes of depression and periods of wellness in between, but they never experience anything but the lows. Then we talk about manic depressive illness, mm -hmm. in which people experience both the low mood and high mood, extremely high mood, uh, that in some ways can be as debilitating as the depression. And we refer to that as manic depressive illness or bipolar depression. Which is more common? The unipolar is more common. But in addition, another kind of depression is the what we call dysthymia, the unhappiness, the, the bad mood. And that can be chronic. It often is chronic. And it can go on for quite a while. It's that requires a different kind of treatment approach, typically, than what we consider depressive illness. And, and uh, Does that feed on itself? Uh, you, you're blue all the time. You just, after a while, mm -hmm. you just, that, that, that is part of your personality. You can't mm -hmm. pull yourself out of it. it. It does feed on itself, and there are people that have what we call double depression, which is the chronic dysthymia, and then they have episodes of major depressive illness. We want to discuss the causes of depression when we return. We're going to take a few minutes out and we're going to give you the opportunity to get to your telephones and call with any questions you may have about depression. Our phone number is 622-1555 and we'll be right back. One of Britain's best loved and longest running dramas, Emma Dale Farm, comes to roost at QEX. Set in the heart of the beautiful Yorkshire Dales, Emma Dale centers around two farming families, the Sugdens and the Skillbecks. With all the rivalry, jealousy, tragedy, and adultery of the best soap operas, Emma Dale Farm also has a soft side, a benevolent matriarch, an eccentric pub owner, a righteous vicar, and of course, sheep. It's EastEnders in the country. Weekdays at four, come home to Emmerdale Farm. Are you there? Call her high. Donahue. For over 23 years, this Emmy Award-winning talk show host has brought viewers face-to-face -face with some of the world's most important, intriguing, and controversial newsmakers. Don't you think this is a great democratic idea? You've got to be impressed. What's a great democratic the idea? Constant. Vladimir Posner, an outspoken and highly controversial commentator, an innovative host on Soviet television. He's recognized in this country as a best-selling author and a leading authority on U.S.-Soviet relations and international politics. Now, these groundbreaking television Television hosts bring their experience and expertise to an exciting new project. This week, with Phil Donahue and Vladimir Posner. You Posner and Donahue, right. Sunday night at 9, here on WQEX. Sunday morning, all green thumbs are hereby requested to plant themselves in front of the TV. At 9, the Victory Garden highlights fabulous feats of fauna around the world and in your backyard. Then at 9.30, the new garden teaches you how to become a politically correct tender of the earth. The bugs are our friends, really. Before you tend to the greenery, join us for a little inspiration. An hour of gardening every Sunday morning on WQEX. Let's get some legitimate questions. 
Welcome back to AgeWise. We're talking about adult depression tonight, and our guests are Dr. Mm. Ellen Frank and Dr. Jules Rosen. And our phone lines are open. The number again is 622-1555. What causes depression? Well, I guess the first answer I need to give is we don't know. But we have some good guesses. I think our current way of looking at what causes depression is that depression grows out of an interaction between a certain level of vulnerability to becoming depressed and certain amount of life stress. We see individuals whose vulnerability to depression is so high that in the absence of any stress whatsoever, they may just slip into an episode of depression for no reason that we can see in their environment. Other people are so invulnerable to depression that no matter how high the stress becomes, they lose their home, they lose their job, nothing. They may get ulcers, but they don't become the depressed. The glass is always half full. Well, they may have other kinds of problems, but their vulnerability is not to depression. Most people are somewhere in between, and that is that some amount of vulnerability and some amount of stress leads to an episode of depression. Dr. Rosen, the, the first type that, uh, that Dr. Frank described, would this be due to a chemical imbalance? <clears throat> yes, there, that's what it's called. We, we don't know what the imbalance is exactly, and we don't know why it's there. But we do know that the best evidence of chemical imbalance is, is, comes from, number one, it responds to medication. So something mm -hmm. must be being corrected. There are other things such as sleep disturbance, disturbance of sleep architecture, disturbance of certain endocrine functions within depression that suggest that there is a change within the brain, within the nervous system. What about the condition that we refer to as SAD, seasonal affective mm -hmm. disorder? Mm -hmm. Is this a real, a real condition? Oh, it's a very real condition. Um, we certainly see patients at Western Psychiatric who do have seasonal episodes of depression. Um, both individuals with very severe episodes and individuals with somewhat milder episodes, which nonetheless occur on a yearly basis. Um, one of the women in a long-term treatment study that we did had not made Thanksgiving dinner for 27 years when she came into our study because every year at Thanksgiving she had been depressed. On the other hand, she'd organized the block party for the 4th of July every year for the so last... She was great in the spring. So she was great in the spring and summer and severely depressed every winter. The good news story is that with effective treatment, she hasn't had a winter depression now for, I think, eight no, years. She's cooking Thanksgiving she's, dinner. She's cooking Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. We have a caller on line seven. Go ahead, you're on the air. I would like to know why lithium is prescribed and what it's supposed to do. Hmm. Okay. Um, lithium is a actually a salt which was first discovered in the 1940s in Australia and was first used in the treatment of bipolar depression, manic depressive illness. But some individuals think that it is also helpful for unipolar depression. I think in our programs it wouldn't be our first treatment choice for a unipolar depression, but certainly something we would use for individuals who have manic depressive illness. Another drug that is very controversial, uh, Prozac. Prozac is a very controversial drug. <clears throat> it is a, as with most drugs, it is, it has its good points and its bad points. And the press and the hype that it has gotten really is, is not, uh, the drug does not deserve that much hype. And, or conversely, perhaps all drugs deserve that much scrutiny. Let's take another call. Uh, we have a caller on line eight. Go ahead. I was going to ask about Prozac. I've been on it for three years, mm -hmm. and um, to go off of it, I mean, can you just go off, or do you have to be weaned off of it? <laughs> go ahead, Jules. <clears throat> Prozac, by virtue of its half life, by how long it hangs around, actually weans itself. So if you were to stop it, you would not. Typically, you would not feel a withdrawal symptom. You would slowly withdraw from the drug naturally, and I'm talking over several weeks. Mm -hmm. But it's important to point out that that is not true of virtually all of the other antidepressant medications. Almost all of the other antidepressants require a slow tapering of the medication so that the patient doesn't experience um, some uncomfortable symptoms as the drug is leaving their system. It, it's also important that you consult with your doctor before you go off the drug because whoever puts you on that should know that you're doing this. 
Dr. Frank, we were talking uh, about the symptoms uh, of depression. What about stress and what about people who have legitimate reasons to be depressed? Uh, they have illness in the family, uh, there's a loss of job, a loss of money, maybe they threaten with losing their home. Don't some people have the right to be depressed? Well, I think everyone has the right to be depressed, and I think that that's the most important point that we can make. You don't have to be stressed in order to be depressed, but if you're stressed, you also have the right to be depressed. Treatment can be effective whether the person seems to have a stress-related depression or one that came out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And that's another important point to make. Just because the depression came on as a result of a series of very real life stresses doesn't mean that it can't be treated. What is the risk of recurrent bouts of depression? Excellent question. Not only recurrent bouts of depression, but untreated depression. And I'm going to focus mainly on the elderly. The most obvious risk is suicide. But beyond that, when people are depressed, they stop eating, they stop exercising. That puts many people at risk for osteoporosis and compression. I've seen many people with severe compression fractures because their depression was not effectively treated. Uh, ultimately, it can be a fatal illness. People develop pneumonia and, and die. So the, the impact of not treating the depression far outweighs the risks that may be part of the treatment. I think if there's one message that we want to get out there tonight is that there is help available. Yes. There is, if not a cure, there, there's help, there's treatment. We have another caller on line seven. Go ahead. Yes, I want to know what is the relationship between fatigue and depression, and can fatigue be treated? Are we talking about chronic fatigue yeah, chronic, syndrome? Yes, chronic fatigue. All right. This is a very complicated question to which the best minds um, have applied themselves and have not yet come up with an answer. There is a substantial overlap between the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome and the symptoms of major depression. There also may be some overlap in, in terms of the, the, the Epstein-Barr virus titer, that you, the, the, the sort of blood test that is done mm -hmm. for um, chronic fatigue syndrome, there does seem to be an excess of positive Epstein-Barr titers in individuals with major depression, and no one knows why. Maybe you want to add something to that, Jules? No, I really have nothing to add. That It is a very puzzling and interesting subject. Excellent question. Then we're just going to go right on to our next caller on line six. Go ahead. Good evening. Will you comment on uh, depression being hereditary, and if so, mm -hmm. uh, the treatment, would it be both uh, psychological and uh, medicinal? Well, we certainly do know that depression aggregates in families. If you come from a family where there is depression, you are at greater risk for depression. Um, but having had a depression certainly does not mean that you're going to pass it on to your children. There are, there are certain things that seem to increase the risk that depression may be passed on. And that has to do with having a very early onset of depression, so that an individual who has his or her first episode of depression, let's say, at the age of 17 or 18 or 20, is much more likely, it seems, to pass that depression on to their children mm -hmm. than someone who has their first onset later in life. In your practices, do you see more women than men? Definitely. The women get depression more often than men. Do we get depression more often than men, or do men perhaps mask their depression? That's an, another excellent question, and one that people have been trying to sort out for. How about with alcohol? Maybe, well, uh, maybe the male well, would the, lean on alcohol more than the female. The latest data would suggest that even if you consider alcoholism in men as a kind of equivalent or, or some kind of related disorder to the depression seen in women, it still does not account for the, the true excess of depression in women. Women come for treatment more often than men, but also in community studies where um, there's random sampling of households done, there's still about a threefold excess of women over men who experience depression. We know you just completed a five-year study mm -hmm. on depression in the elderly, and we want to talk about that. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Again, I invite your phone call, 622-1555. Join the Victory Garden every week as we guide you through the growing season. 
Our hosts will show you how to grow the best tasting vegetables and the most beautiful flowers. And you're all invited to come along as we visit some of America's best gardens. We'll introduce you to master gardeners and escort you through some of the finest gardens in the world. So be sure to join us every week right here on the Victory Garden. Let us entertain you Wednesday night at 9.30. The Boston Globe calls it a show with substance and soul. Sheer integrity, says the New York Times. Meaty content, sober style of a less frantic era, writes Time magazine. Touching you in a way newscasts seldom do, says the LA Times. Isn't it time you found out what our peers already know? Watch World Monitor. Weeknights at 10, here on QEX. Tomorrow morning, you could veg out to Deborah and Bryant, or Joan and Charles, or Harry and Paula, or you could get the lead out with us. No matter your age, you can always limber up with Mary Ann Wilson. She teaches how to sit and be fit. Or try a high energy workout with Margaret Richard and the gang from Body Electric. Or join Amy Esterhay and friends for low impact aerobics in Home Stretch. Take your pick, but get your day started right with one of our workout shows tomorrow morning on QEX. Our show this week features songs and dances from our stage show at Lake Tahoe. And here are some highlights. Once in love with Amy. Everybody loves somebody sometimes. And I gotta keep singing. Back to Age Wise Weekly, we're talking about adult depression, and uh, we have several callers on the line. We do want to talk to Dr. Uh, Frank about her five-year program on elderly depression, but first, let's take this call on line eight. Yes, this uh, concerns seasonal depression. Mm -hmm. I've heard some information about a light box treatment. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that, and could you tell me where I might get more information about that? Well, you can get more information about it by calling the um, uh, scheduling and information office at Western Psychiatric, and the number is 624-1000. There are... Uh, there is evidence that very bright light, much brighter than any of us would ordinarily expose ourselves to indoors, may be an effective treatment for people who have a particular subtype of seasonal mood disorder. So if that seems to be what's happening for you, I think it's worth exploring. Thank you for the phone call. Now let's get to your study, a five-year study, and you were dealing with older actually, people. No, actually the study we've just completed was I would call midlife depression, 21 to 65 year olds. We're now in the, about the second year of an identical study of 60 to 80 year olds. All right. What did you learn from okay. the study you've just completed? The question we were asking, we're pretty good at treating an episode of depression, but we really hadn't been very effective at preventing new episodes of depression in individuals who were having recurring bouts of depression. So the question we were asking was, would medication or psychotherapy or the combination be the most effective way of preventing new episodes of depression in people at high risk for new episodes. And the answer we came out with was really quite clear. Keeping a patient on the same dose of antidepressant medication that had gotten them out of the episode was extremely effective at keeping them from having a new episode. Monthly sessions of an interpersonally focused psychotherapy was moderately effective in lengthening the well interval, but didn't really prevent new episodes of depression. And the patients who got neither the psychotherapy nor the active medication really did very poorly. 80% of those, those individuals had a new episode of depression during the course of our study. So there's no doubt then that medication is working. It, it seems to work extremely effectively and we expect the result will be similar in the elderly, although we think actually that psychotherapy may be even more potent in this group. We have another caller on line six. Go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if either Dr. Frank or Dr. Rosen could briefly describe the therapeutic process for alleviating depression, um, particularly manic depression. Are you referring to the psychotherapeutic process? I guess. You... 
Uh, the, she hung up, so I think okay. we're just going to have to try to guess what okay. she was uh, what she was referring to. Dur during an acute episode of illness, you want to treat with the most effective means possible. And as Dr. Frank just said, for for unipolar depression, it probably applies to bipolar as well. Medications are essential, and that typically involves lithium. And there are some other excellent medications, and it may involve a combination of medications. Psychotherapy is often very helpful in helping people deal with their life stresses that may precipitate an episode or, or put them back into a, uh, into a relapse. In fact, I should mention, we've just been funded to do a 10-year study of manic depressive illness where we're actually looking at how helpful the addition of psychotherapy might be to patients with manic depressive illness treated with lithium. So if our caller is interested in that information, she also can call 624-1000. What about shock treatment? Is that still being used? It is still being used. It is a very controversial treatment in some circles. It is a highly effective treatment of depression. It is better than medication in terms of getting very resistant patients out of this severe depression. And the risks are probably lower than using medications. I, I would just add, people have such terrible fears about uh, shock treatment that when we have a pregnant patient, the safest treatment we have is shock treatment. And that's the treatment yeah. we go to. So I think people have such a wrong idea about shock therapy. We only have a couple of minutes left. And since Christmas is one week from tonight, I think we, we have to talk about the depression that occurs around the holidays. There is a, a sadness that occurs with so many people. What is it? Is it that our expectations are so high? We want we want holidays to be like the Norman Rockwell painting, and it <laughs> just doesn't turn out that way. Well, I think there are a number of things that conspire for many people to feel sad, not necessarily clinically depressed at the holidays. Exhaust. Excuse me, isn't the suicide rate higher at, at this time of year? Not necessarily. I, I don't think there's no. evidence for that. Do you? I don't know. No. I really don't know. I think the actual peaks of suicide are in April and some other um, right, but back October. To, back to the holiday blues. Our expectations often exceed the reality. You're right, it's not the Norman Rockwell painting we all dreamed about. People get exhausted at the holidays. They, they fall out of their normal rhythms of eating and sleeping, and all of that can lead to dysphoria, to feeling sad, uncomfortable, like you have less energy than you want, you're less optimistic than you want to be. So I think the best thing we can do around the holidays is to n not set our expectations so high, try as hard as we can to stick to our normal rhythms of eating and sleeping, and it is a challenge around the holidays, and to surround ourselves with the people who, whom we really enjoy. Not, not the people we're obligated to be with. And say to ourselves, it's okay if I'm not happy all the time. I think that's another thing. We, we just get the message that everybody mm -hmm. has to be happy. Everybody else is happy. Why aren't I? I want to thank you. You've made me very happy tonight, <laughs> both you. of you, Dr. Thank Ellen you. Frank, Dr. Jules Rosen. It has been a very fast-paced half hour. We can do this again sometime very soon. I want to invite all of you to join me next Wednesday night. It is Christmas night, but we're going to have a special program for you at 8 o'clock, and I promise it's going to be a happy program. Thank you again for joining me. This is AgeWise Weekly. I'm Eleanor Shano. Good night. Wow, it was wonderful. Was it was just, there's just too much. <laughs>